It says we're alive. So let me make sure it's on my Facebook. Hmm. Oh, it's live. I see it on Facebook. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're going to give everybody about a couple, like a couple of seconds, not even a minute. But anyway, while we're doing that, it's so good to see you, Daniel Blackman, okay. Linda Jones, and Teresa Hardy. It's so good to see my friends. Did everyone have a great day? Yes. Yes. Great day. Great day. We have so much to talk about. We have so much to talk about today. Like today is one of those days that uh, we could just go in any direction with everything that's popping off uh, in America, especially within the Black community. Correct? That's right. Okay. So for those who are joining in with us tonight, for the first time, well, actually, this is on our second time experimenting, I am D. Dawkins Hagler. And um, that's at the bottom, you see Teresa Hardy. And we decided last week, I kept saying, you know, we need to have some black girl chit chat. And so from black girl chit chat, a week later, here we are. And today we decided to bring on uh, some of our friends with us today to talk about some of the salient issues that are pressing us um, in America, especially as it relates to voting rights here in the state of Georgia. So. Daniel, a lot of people don't know uh, who you are. Uh, could you, in one minute or less, kind of tell people who you are? Yes. Um, first of all, D, uh, President Hardy and uh, Leonard, it's good to see you and I'm um, happy to be here. Daniel Blackman, former Democratic nominee for the Public Service Commission in Georgia, um, community advocate, uh, lover of civil and human rights. I'm just here to contribute to the conversation and, and to learn from each of the panelists but also to inform the community. And D, I, I appreciate your leadership in this space. And I appreciate you allowing all of us to just take this opportunity to really have a discussion the community has been waiting for. So thank you. Thank you. And Daniel, we want to thank you for uh, putting yourself up for office when you ran for public service commissioner. A lot of people don't know uh, what the public service commissioner does, uh, what they're responsible for, and you enlighten people across the state of Georgia on this issue uh, when you ran. And we just knew you were going to go in uh, with uh, Senator Warnock and Senator Ossoff. I mean, I mean, I was crying, like literally, like, oh my God, how, how did um, Daniel Blackman, the black man, not get in um, on this ticket? But do you plan on running again, Daniel? Do you want to answer that right now? Uh, wow, you see, that's D right there. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna right now just make sure that we work on these voting bills. And you know, will I get out there again? I'm definitely not going anywhere. But D, I think both of us would agree in our faith that you know that calling. Um, if I'm called in that direction and and that door opens, then 110 percent I'll be back out there. But right now, I feel like the best place for me to be is being a liaison in our community and being an advocate. For, uh, for the folks that are really being impacted the most, but I'll definitely let you know first. Okay, thank you so much. And for those of y'all who are watching tonight, please share this, because we're getting ready to have some real deep conversations. And I'm telling y'all, we're not gonna hold back anything. We're gonna say exactly what we have to say, and people are just gonna, you know, if we hurt any feelings, you know, we're sorry, but something's gonna have to be said tonight because our very uh, livelihood depends on it. Uh, Lena Jones, you're in tonight for Jerry Rose. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what is New uh, New Order. A lot of people don't know what New Order is. Yes, ma'am. I'm the national spokesperson for New Order National Human Rights Organization. Our CEO is Gerald Rose, and we're a lot like your regular civil rights act uh, organizations. However, we focus on human rights specifically, and what that means is we have various parts of our organizations that deal with injustice on a global level. Uh, dealing with issues that are going before the UN for African Americans as a people in the United States, as well as working with people here in our local areas, deal with their school boards, police departments. Uh, Gerald launched a campaign this year touring all over the state of Georgia to make sure that we have open door policies with sheriff's departments and local police, not just here in Georgia, he's doing it all over the United States on this sort of this tour, you would call it. And it's to make sure that people have an advocate to restore relationships with law enforcement agencies. And we also have our vice president who is working on that, that piece that we need for health and human resources in Georgia, as far as helping people 
with basic minimums, clothing, shelter, and all those types of supports they need going through struggles like this. Of course, we feed the homeless as well. We partner with local organizations, which is our backbone. It's because we got folks like you. I mean, I'm so grateful to you for just the many years I've known you just doing activism here in Georgia. Miss Hardy has always been showing up because I think it's so important that our legacy groups reconnect with younger people so they understand what has been fought for, what has been gained, and they definitely know what is being lost. Okay, we're gonna come back to you, Leonard, but Leonard, a lot of people, I heard a little birdie that told me some years ago that New Order was kind of like uh, the Black Panther Party remix <laughs> two point, uh, oh, is that true? Well, I think that a lot of that is true, but I definitely see a, a lobbying piece an organization for African-American issues. We really like to bring people together. And that's why we're here this evening, because we need one strategy that we all know about. And we play those positions to win the championship. I like them jerseys, bro. I know, cause right, he's ready back then, right? He is ready. I, I'm looking at his um, his jersey right now. He's ready. He's ready. We're going to come back to him in the Brian jerseys. Now, Robert Tello, the man of the out. Robert Tello, you want me to hey. introduce you? I'm going to introduce you. Or you want to introduce yourself? Go ahead. You're my hype, man. You like my okay, so I'm his, hi I, I'm his hype person. So we have Rob Patello, who is uh, the host of Patello Radio on 1380 WAOK. He is also um, the executive direct director of the Peachtree Project, which means he's kind of like um, the regional person, no, the national person, regional person for Rainbow Push. So, you know, he was very influential in the boycott that we have for sports in the state of Georgia when Reverend Jesse Jackson first called for the the boycott of sports and entertainment. Robert Patello put it together and brought some of us on and we all protested. And as you saw, MLB pulled out of Georgia. So don't let anybody tell you anything. We have receipts. Thankful to <laughs> Robert Patello and Rainbow Push and Reverend Jesse Leon Jackson. Kimberlyn Carter, what happened to your face? What happened to you, boo? <laughs> Where you at, girl? What happened? She's not representing Georgia right now with Rep Georgia. She didn't disappear on us. Okay. There she I mean, is. There she is. <laughs> Kimberly Carter, are you going to introduce you yourself? You want me to introduce you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Kimberly Carter. I'm the executive director for Represent Georgia Action Network. We are a C4 formulated to support the state civic and civic engagement and progressive agenda. Okay, so what she didn't say was she is the organizer behind a lot of political movements in the country, not just Georgia. She's a great democratic strategist. She will get you all the way together. And so she's oh, in God. those rooms that many of us cannot get into yeah. when they strategize and that's Kimberlyn Carter. So y'all don't know how to fool you. Now, let me tell you why I assembled this team together tonight. We all know what's going on with Georgia with the voting rights, how the bill was passed, SB 202. Uh, we've heard a lot of chit chat about whether we should boycott uh, corporations, whether or not we should be boycotting major league um, professional sports and entertainers. And then there are some, some who said we should just roll, let it roll on by and just, you know, do nothing. Others think we should be, you know, balls to the wall. Uh, and then others think don't know, don't know what to do. So we're gonna start right now, just for a second, with Robert Patello. Patello, what in the world is going on with this bill, and why is it important? Uh, uh, let's talk, go back in history a little bit, uh, because I think it's important to set the table for exactly what's going on, and that helps to inform many of the responses that we have and some of the objections that uh, exist right now. Uh, up until 1997, there was absolutely no voter ID requirement in the state of Georgia. You walked in onto the same precinct you walked into to your, your entire life, and you voted and you went home. Uh, the 97 bill created the need for you to identify yourself, but you could do so with a utility bill and uh, a whole series of other ways to identify yourself. Before that bill was passed, and it was passed in 97, but the first time it was really implemented was in that 2002 election, so my freshman year of college. Um, from 1872 
until 2002. For 130 years, Georgia never had a Republican governor. Since it went into effect in 2002, Georgia has only had Republican governors since that 1997 voter ID bill. Fast forward a couple years, 2005, 15 years ago, Georgia passes a uh, requirement for a photo ID. So no longer just an identification. Now you have to have a state issued photo ID. If you did not have an ID, it will cost you $20 for two years or $30 for five years in order to have that state issued ID. It was struck down in the beginning of 2006 as a poll tax. So yes, Georgia had a poll tax 15 years ago. Uh, it was reformed by the state legislature in early 2006, um, but it really didn't um, didn't take effect uh, until it was approved by the courts um, for taking out the uh, the payment requirement. And so it really went to effect in 2010 for that election cycle. Uh, in 2006, Thurbert Baker won with almost 60 percent of the vote, a black Democrat. Uh, Michael Thurman won with almost 60 percent of the vote. I think he had 55 percent, uh, a black Democrat. Tommy Irvin had 70 percent. Uh, we had five statewide elected officials win in 2006 as Democrats. Uh, since the bill went into effect effectively in 2010, no African-American or Democrat was elected statewide from 2010 until January of 2021. So that is 11 years simply because of the voter ID law, which took place in Georgia. Now, uh, the argument that I've heard is, well, you know, the state uh, changed, the demographics changed, so that's why Democrats weren't winning. If you look at what happened in 2002, uh, Roy Barnes in that election that he lost to Sonny Perdue got 811,000 votes in a, gu a gubernatorial race in 2002. Daniel Blackman got 2 million votes in 2020 <laughs> because the state has grown that much. And it has not grown in a bunch of uh, MAGAs and rednecks coming in. It is transplants from up north. There's young people, African-Americans. You have a state that when these 2020 census numbers finally come out, we're going to be about 35% African American, 16% Latino, uh, eight, uh, 6 to 8% Asian, 54% women, one of the largest LGBTQ populations in the country. Uh, in addition to our college population, we've seen Georgia State, West Georgia, Columbus State, uh, Georgia Southern all expand into major universities. So the demographics of the state have changed. And that is the reason that this voter suppression bill was put into place, not because there were questions about election integrity. The exact same rules that Republicans ruled over the state for a decade with were in place in 2020. The same rules that they put in place after that voter, uh, the voter ID bill in 2006 and that election compromise in 2011 have been in place for a decade. There had never been a question about election integrity until they started losing, when the demographics caught up with the law, and that's why they put these laws in place. So this is why it's important we get on the right footing and understand exactly what they're doing, because they went from zero Republican governors for 130 years started putting in voter suppression laws, and now we've had nothing but Republican domination for two decades. If they're allowed to get away with it this time, then we can count on another decade of Republican domination in the state of Georgia, setting us even further back. So this is why it's important to take every effort possible in order to repeal the bill, be that an economic boycott. We saw that happen in North Carolina because of their transgender bathroom bill back in 2016. Uh, in the 90s in Arizona, they refused to ratify the King holiday. They moved the Super Bowl out of that state. That policy changed. We know that economic boycotts work when it comes to changing public policy, which is against the manifest interest of the American people. That's why we have to make these push in time for negotiation was a couple weeks uh, was months ago when it was in the legislature. The time for action is now. So thank you. And I'm, I want y'all to catch that. If you didn't get the replay, and this is why I wanted Patello to start off so he could give us a history lesson, because a lot of people are talking, have no type of understanding of how we got to where we are, and we needed to have that foundation for a second so we can go where we're trying to go. Now, we know what the situation is. He laid it out for us. Daniel Blackman and, and Kimberly Carter, uh, then I'm going to come to you and y'all do the second. What's the problem? Why is this message not getting out? Starting with you, Daniel Blackman, then you, Kim Guard. What, what, what's up? Yeah, the message is not getting out because um, you put me right after Robert, so you're going to have that. You, you got me digging. But no, it, it's on a serious note. I'm going to give an example. You know, when you look at the Montgomery bus boycott that lasted for, you know, 381 days, one, one year, 16 days, it was organized. You know, it was caused by you know multiple factors specifically said yeah, it was what organized was, is that your thing teresa that you can it, tell it, organized i'm sorry it, man. It was organized but you know what most people don't understand was you know claudette calvin was was the original woman that that, that took that seat but the organization of 11 folks that sat down 
and planned a strategy to remove 75% of Montgomery's bus system, that plan was enacted. There was infrastructure there and there was communication. There weren't groups operating in silos. There were individuals that believed, understood, and agreed to the fact that while everyone might not have been on the same page, the folks that were organizing it had, a, had one message, one commitment, and a mm -hmm. strategy to take them from the time that issue came up all the way through they got the result they needed and as a result we saw on multiple occasions broader verse gale where we saw uh segregation on buses struck down we saw um the emergence of dr king most folks don't even realize dr king's emergence was contingent on the montgomery bus boycott and we see the creation of the southern christian leadership conference so a lot of these things happen as a result of being organized and right now we have too many organizations that are operating separately. And, you know, and because we're on this forum, I'll say it, you know, I think we have to be very careful about picking sides. You know, the other side has one strategy, weaponized fear. That's it. They, they have their talking point, their platform, and they're going to go at it. And when you have a governor that stands in a restaurant that's not even black owned, and tout the fact that black businesses are hurt as if he's a champion for our businesses that shows that we're not controlling our own narrative because other folks are speaking as if they have a solution that we're not privy to. And I'm thankful to see Leonard and to see President Teresa and to see Kimberlyn and yourself because we all represent different spectrums. Robert being the media guy, but we all represent different spectrums of organizers. And when grassroots organized leaders are working opposite of each other, not in coalition, there's it's a lot harder to get a consistent message. And, and my hope and my prayer for this conversation tonight is to spark that conversation because we don't have the luxury of another year. I mean, we got gerrymandering coming up. We got statewide elections coming up. We got brothers being shot in the street. Like these are all issues that are happening in real time. And too often in our communities, we suffer from short term memory. We, we, we did a tremendous job getting this this state flipped over to the right side and getting the United States Senate to have uh, Pre Vice President Harris shot and, and the Kim street Biden. like these but, are all issues. But, but our responsibility now has to be on moving this state forward. And I couldn't sum it up better than what Mr. Patello said. When you when you change the rules to the game and democracy catches up to laws in places, I mean, the demographic catches up to the laws in place, we see a, a reaction of what we're experiencing right now. And our job is to recognize it and recognize the challenges that we're setting in front of ourselves. I don't blame Republicans for the, for the discombobulation we're seeing right now. I blame us for not being able to be smart enough to get ahead of this conversation by working together, communicating with each other and sharing information on a consistent basis. Thank you, but I, I wanna just catch something you said. I don't know if it was a Freudian slip or not. You said uh, gerrymandering is coming up. You didn't say redistricting, you said, and gerrymandering is coming up in the session. I just thought, you know, that was kind of interesting how you did this. So Kimberlyn, what do you have to say to, to, to all of this? I mean, we you, you've been on some calls, you've been hearing different things and, Every time someone asks somebody in Georgia, well, what's the plan? Will you tell us what's the plan, Kimberly? What is it? <laughs> what's the plan? It's a delay. She's on mute. She's on mute. She's on mute. Kimberly, you're on mute. It's okay. Well, so what's the plan? The first plan is for us to stop dropping fake money on folks. Okay. So that that's that's, that's <laughs> the first plan. Well, let's make two that the first claim is that currency is the currency that is accepted at local and national and international retailers now um now you know i was gonna y'all know y'all know that i was going to to cut up um i am like over here right now um in freak out mode because i understand that some kind of skinny version of hr1 has been introduced um which is removing some of the campaign finance stuff and some of the redistricting um, reform as well. And so those of us who know, those of us who've worked on the Hill before, who have um, understand how, how these things worked, how these things work rather, um, we expected that um, there was going to be some shaving down, which I am um, completely against. I want us to pass HR1 and HR4 as they are but um it looks like some things are already going on um where there's some skinnier versions um uh, being introduced um 
in, in terms of, of what the goal is, well, we, we know what the central, what the main, um, what the main goal is. And those are those three goals. We need corporate accountability. Um, these same folks who were waving the Black Lives Matter flag only, what, about six to seven months ago, um, who were dropping millions everywhere and all over the nation in support of racial justice initiatives, um, cannot continue to also fund the enemies of our progress. So we know that the number one goal is that level of corporate accountability. Um, that we are, in, and I, don't, I hope to not offend anyone on here, but it's time for us to have more conversations about how these corporations are defunding the GOP. Defund the GOP. Um, you, you, you know, you, I know it's a couple of preachers on here. You serve two masters, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so the real is um, defund the, the GOP. And then secondly, um, and, and then secondly, there also still has to be pressure um, on this governor as well. Um, D, you are a former state legislator. You know that he has the option to veto. There is a repeal process that is also optional. Um, so still, there is pressure that still needs to be applied on this, um, on the man that sits in this seat um, there in, in the governor's uh, office. And last, and certainly um, not least, the goal is to make sure that we are continuing to register voters, to talk to our communities about what is going on, to begin to re-educate people about what Jim Crow is. I know for those of us on this particular panel who are well-read, who have matriculated at amazing um, uh, schools and in other ways that we've educated ourselves. But there are so many of our own people like Jim Crow 2.0, what exactly does that mean? So we need to also be in spaces where our goal is to make sure that we are properly educating our people um, on, on all of this. And all of us who have connections and networks at these county levels with county elections administrators, with people doing grassroots work at the county level, as well as um, elected folk that we know, we also need to be making sure that they are informed and they, they are of an understanding of what the implications are of these laws. Hey, hey, D, really, really, really quickly, Kimberlyn's made a point earlier about um, the amount of money these corporations committed at the height of what we saw after Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, um, that number is $534 million. You know, I actually met with financial an analysts across the country. $534 million was committed to fight racial- Where did it go? Where did that money go? And here's, here's the thing. A lot of that money from these corporations went right into themselves to create so-called diversity and inclusion officers when we all understand we don't need you to change the culture from within without having an investment and a commitment to what's going on in the very truth outside of the windows you're sitting behind and indeed just to um to kimberlin's point about jim crow 2.0 uh, I think one of the this one of the failings of our public education system and also of uh, us educating our own community because most people don't understand what Jim Crow is. They know Jim Crow was bad, but that's about pretty much the, the extent of what they know. Uh, Jim Crow was a suite of laws and regulations which systematically were meant to beat back and repeal the 13th, 14th, and 15th Jim Amendments. Uh, and so because of that, you had to look at things such as literacy tests, and they would always have an ostensibly race-neutral justification. So literacy tests, they would say, we want to make sure that we have an educated electorate that can make proper decisions. That's why we have to test them to make sure that they know what's going on, and that's why we need to make them count the bubbles in a bar of soap. Uh, that was a literacy test. They would have a uh, ostensibly race-neutral justification, but in practice, it was discriminatory. 
poll taxes. We want to make sure that the people who have enough money to invest in the, uh, into the, our communities have a voice. We want to ensure that they have the ability to have their voices heard and that they should have a say. Land owning, owning requirement. The people who own land have the most interest in what's going on in our community, so we want to make sure that they get a voice in who the elected officials are. All of those were ostensibly race neutral methods by which to ensure that the uh, to elect people, but in practice, what it was was a way to disenfranchise African Americans and reinstate the status quo antebellum before the Civil War to put us back in a, a position of servitude, even though in many southern states we had the majority of the population. So when you talk about, well, if I need a uh, ID to go to the liquor store, to go to the bank, why should I need an ID to vote? That's why it's called Jim Crow 2.0, because the same oh, justification that they right. had for poll taxes and literacy tests, now they're using for voter ID in order to help disenfranchise people. Okay, thank you. Now, we've heard, now we've gotten 2.0. We know what Jim Crow is. We know what's going on with the bill. Now, the two people who are really on the ground, grassroots, we have Larry and we have Teresa. Teresa, what say you? <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's get this straight. This is only happening. Okay, somebody's in phone. Somebody's somebody's the echo. I don't know what's going on. I don't have my phone. Okay. Is that good okay, now? Everybody, everybody, um, mute except except Teresa. Because I okay. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. <laughs> you got me on screen. So yeah. So let's um get yeah, a I just figured out how to use it. Okay, let's get a better understanding of this. This is one thing we need to keep in the forefront is racism happened to black people. That, the racism part is with black people. And what we've been able to do through all of these going back from slavery to where we are today, everything's happened to the black person to hold the black person back. Now we have put ourselves in a point where we went from then uh, the, the, the N word to uh, colored to black African American, we're the only race of people that actually have all of these different names. And why so is that? So that we get excluded, we keep getting excluded. Even with the conversation of racial equity or inequity, we are excluded. Now, there was money that was being pushed out for racial. Uh, justice, social justice, and none of it still got to the right people. It didn't get to the black people. Uh, corporations did not get it to the black people. What we have to realize too is the people who are representing us and saying that they're for the black community, they're not for the black community. I don't know who they are representing, but it's not coming back here. Now, when we were talking about the boycott and the fact that it's disorganized, it's disorganized because it doesn't have a complete circle of people. When you start looking at the protests um, and the uh, press conferences and you don't have a diverse outlook of people, when I say that, I'm talking about if it's going to be pastoral, it needs to be all the different pastors. It doesn't need to be one set of, of, of religion. And because you're doing something in the civil rights or social justice movement, you need to be inclusive of civil rights people and most definitely you got to have people on the ground. And what has happened to us um, in support of the boycott, the messaging has been so um, disboggulated that we don't even know what we're supposed to be doing. Everybody just call it out, boycott, 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 but we don't even know what the end game supposed to be. I think the best one to see is what um, uh, Attorney Patillo pushed out. Here's what we're going to do with sports and entertainment. You saw what happened. They pulled out. Now, we're talking about going against the people who um, were uh, supporting the voter or supported people who voted for the voter corporations. suppression bill. Mm -hmm. Corporations, all right, so we're going after them, but how are we going after them? Just to have a meeting? Okay, now you have the meeting. After the meeting, what is supposed to happen? In the end, our people are still suffering. We still have this voter suppression bill. We still have people who... Uh, that we need to really be thinking about what are we going to do for our com our community on getting the quality of life that we also deserve. Which so are is, you saying? What are you saying? Are you saying we should or should not boycott? We are. We should boycott, but the boycott shouldn't be based on uh, the fact that we get into a meeting. The boycott should be where we're going to make a 
true change to our community, a true economic change to our community. I could, our community should not be the same. Our uh, The idea of having access to capital should not be the same. Our quality education should not be the same. We should be moving to a different level uh, within our community. Not just going through, the voter suppression is our power, but the other part is how we're going to live after this after this boycott. Okay, hold on. Now, Daniel and Robert, I don't want y'all to give this stage. I just want y'all to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you for the boycott? Yes or no? He's on you mute. Can't hear you. You're on mute. Yes, absolutely yes. Okay, Robert. Well, okay. Are you for the corporation boycott? Absolutely, and I think the goal has to be the repeal of the bill. You boycott until the bill is repealed. Thank you. Now, I'm getting ready to get the floor to you, Leonard. Now, I know you for the boycott. What should we do? What, where are we going? I think just like these folks just mentioned to you, the boycott, we support every boycott that is a boycott for a yeah. actual reason, where at the end of the day, you can actually judge if your action had an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think that what is more refreshing than anything is we're not begging people to step up. Now it's breaking news. A celebrity will say, I'm pull, I'm working on a project right now. Guess what? You might be a power broker, but you're not going to get my talent. Mm. So this is the importance of those younger people with all of that money to spend mm -hmm. to start saying, we ain't going to no events. You can open that dome up all day. You're going to pay more for them, for them lights on, then you're going to collect at that gate. Mm -hmm. Even with the NFL boycott, we had a lot of folks that were not happy with that for whatever reason. Right. That's right. But the fact that so many people came together, even haphazardly the way it happened, mm -hmm. it still had an impact. Now, look at what that impact was. Of course, you got Jay-Z doing his thing. And now you also have a community. Now, if you're watching games, you see labeling all over the place. You see money spent on commercials. You see short films that were just living in social media now on major network channels being ran as actual commercials. So uh, the, those people are doing their part. As an activist, what we're identifying is what is most important is that we're at the table. I think it was Ms. Hardy I heard say on another show at one time, the icing may be blue, but the cake's still red. There's something missing that a law like that in 2021 could even be passed. And we're sitting with the largest congressional black caucus I heard in the United States of America. Well, I mean, they are deep in the legacy of the big universities and the talent and everything right now in Atlanta should be able to shut Atlanta down. It's getting those people to understand the importance that they do this and you get a better response from younger people where now I wonder why that is why, why do you think that is because younger people black and white see this as a horrible illness that needs to go away i'm 50 we should be done with it by now however we look at people in power i use georgia all the time as an example it's a lot of black faces why is that battle still 50 50 here we should be looking at it like my man Robert got the stats. We should be winning every election without money shouldn't even matter right now because it just faces. We're looking at a struggle right now. Are they going to destroy Atlanta this next mayoral election? What is that going to look like? Atlanta is going to represent what this state is going to look like. We see we, we hollering black power, but you couldn't stop a Jim Crow bill. Okay, so so let's let's talk about that for a second. So what happens when you have people that are in the legislature or people who are on the outside, whether they're clergy, whether they are running for, for bigger office or whatever, they say no boycott, or they say pause the boycott. I say we're gonna get back on the boycott. And so what what happens? So what happens tomorrow if the clergy say we're not gonna have a boycott because they having a meeting with corporations tomorrow. So is the boycott over? Do all of y'all who said today that we should boycott say, okay, it's over now because they had a meeting with the corporations? Where do we go from here? What, what, what do we do? 
Well, you, you know, there's. Oh, go ahead. No, no go ahead. Well, well, what I would say is there's a, a great speech from Malcolm X about that, uh, the concept, talking about the March on Washington. And they said that uh, what ended up happening is you had a, a march that was planned and organized by the people, by the, the proletariat, by the folks down in the trenches. Right. And then you had white uh, corporations and media and politicians and leadership insert their own leadership into the, uh, the March on Washington. Uh, as uh, as Malcolm said, you took something that was hot, some uh, so like some coffee, and then you start incorporating it with cream, incorporating <laughs> it with sugar, and so you took something that was hot that will wake you up, that will burn you, and you made it something that will make you docile, that was acceptable, that would not uh, would not offend anybody, that will end up putting you to sleep. So we have to stop looking towards the the big names, the people on camera for leadership and look to the streets for leadership, because the streets will tell you exactly where things are going and where things need to go. And the people who um, who turned out in record numbers, the people who uh, uh, knocked on doors and uh, and really want to make a change in this country and in this uh, this nation. Uh, they are not simply going to sit down and listen to somebody who just because they wear makeup on camera as somebody who wears makeup on camera most of the day, uh, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to listen to their own heart. So leadership will have to follow the lead of the people. Ultimately, that we saw that in the 1960s and we'll see that now. OK. All right. Kimberly, would you want to say something about being on the ground? And, and where should we go? Because everyone else said they were everyone else said they were for the boycott. What are you for, Kimberly? Or you I don't know yet? I'm for liberation of, of black people, but uh, and that is what I am always for. But I, I just wanted to just, um, I, I, I guess I, I have a question of the panel as well, because I, I keep hearing this theme that there is disorganization or mis-messaging or, or something of that nature. And so I'm not necessarily sure that I actually um, uh, th that I actually agree with that um, because currently um, we are fighting on many fronts, and at the level that this has reached, we have inside game going on as well as outside um, game that is is going on. So I don't know where we are necessarily feeling like there is some disorganization, so to speak, because, um, you know, to quote uh, former President uh, Barack Obama, democracy is messy. It doesn't come in some neat little uh, pristine box uh, because we're always dealing with, with human beings. And what we have learned more and more as, as more truths have come to bear, even about the civil rights movement and some of the inside work that was going on, some of the outside work that was going on, some of the groundwork that was going on, I think it takes all of that. I think it is intersectional and that it is multi-generational, that it's not just one direction that's going to take us to where we need to go. Okay. So I think the disorganization, and I'm going to let Daniel speak, I don't think it was, okay. this is just my opinion, because sure. I don't think that the movement of different people doing stuff is disorganized. I think disorganization comes when there is different messages. We should boycott. We shouldn't boycott. Is that what you mean, Ter Teresa? Because that's what you mean, not how it's done and who stands up and says it right. the fact that one group will say, we boycott, another group say, we're not going to boycott. So I think... Right. And I don't know if that's disorganization or that's disagreement. So I'm gonna come back to that. Okay, Danny Black. Can I can I just yeah. piggyback on something right quick? And and I and I just want to say that um and then I think that sometimes we are still in search of the one, right? Um, and not the e pluribus unum, where it's from one, there are many. So all of our leaders aren't going to be neatly packaged and standing up um, on, on some pulpit or standing at some high level over all of the people. Um, we have found leadership in so many amazing spaces um, throughout this entire process. That is why we even saw like a, a young black woman um, down in Sandersville, Georgia, who is a direct descendant of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who did the work and flipped that whole county blue. 
right? And who is even and who is even there now working and organizing about these ridiculous utility bills that happen throughout the Black Belt and with Black folks in rural areas. So there are many voices that are, are rising up and we are not a monolithic people. We don't all think the same. We don't all dress the same. We don't all act the same. So certainly we have reached this space, right? We have reached this space where they are very different and sometimes not always the same um, cookie cutter answers um, to things. And so that that's that's just the, uh, my point of view on that. So, so no, but hold on, Daniel was, okay, wait a minute. Teresa, you was gonna say something, but then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just quickly, just quickly, just to go back to what you said, it's mixed messaging that's getting us um, confused when uh, yes, we're supporting the boycott because we won't change. But then when you're hearing that it's on, it's off, it's on the second, it's on the seven, it's on, it's off, it's paused, that is the mixed messaging that makes it disorganized for the people who are on the grounds who's going to support the message. So we do need to come together to make sure that the message is clear. I think what we've decided on this panel is, yes, we want the boycott because we know what what's um, in the end game that we want to see. But then when you're talking to people and they're saying, well, Teresa, when is the boycott? What we gonna do, what, you know, and they, they mixing it up with a protest, then there is a problem there. So we just wanna make sure that whenever we say we're gonna boycott, let's boycott until we meet the message, as uh, 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 Attorney Roberts said, then we stick to the boycott together. So, um, uh, I'm with you, Kimberly. I'm with y'all. I'm with everybody, but I'm just saying we still need to work on this messaging. Daniel, got you, Teresa. A lot going on at, at the grassroots level. I mean, go ahead, Daniel. Said, you know, all these corporate, uh, all the CEOs just met again. So it's still a lot of work going on. Oh yeah. So what I what I what I'll say is um, the the perspective. You know, with all due respect, um, has to be that we understand first and foremost. Um, and I'm not talking about any one single individual over the years in my lifetime. Um, I'll be 42 this year. Uh, in my lifetime, we have seen on multiple occasions this allowance of the media to let us know who our leaders are. Uh, even when Barack Obama was elected, um, Barack Obama, as phenomenal as he was, um, there were a lot of black folks that did not really identify or understand the journey um, that Obama took and how he got to that point, which meant that while he looked like us, a lot of folks didn't identify at the time. It's not a slight against President Obama. It's just that when we see the media come in and they and they take an individual in our state and says, this individual has, you know, what this person says we're gonna run with, right? When it's propped up like that across the country and in international news and a statement can be made, you have a lot of folks on the ground that quite frankly are looking for that opportunity for their voice to be heard as well. And then when they're seeing five, six, seven, eight publications, and we all know on this phone, media is controlled globally by six families. So when we see the media continuously perpetuating these stories and these messages from one sole source, I agree with you, Kimberlyn. I, I, I think that we are different people. What makes us different makes us unique. What you said, e pluribus unum, out of many one. I get that. I, I really do. I think the challenge is to what D stated is that we have a lot of people that are looking at two things that I think we've not really done a great job at. One of them I said earlier, which is consistency. There are a lot of folks. You want to know why there are, uh, there are so many uh, registered inactive Democratic voters, not just from the black community, but all over the place because they're watching. They're looking for consistency. They're looking for someone that when they say something, they're going to do something and not give them a stump speech. And they're going to be there when they say it. And they're going to be there through throughout the process. And a lot of times over the years, not just with the boycott of Major League Baseball, we're seeing us very much loud and 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 consistent. And then that that sense of aggression, it drops off. And I think for many of us, like, especially for a person like myself, I can't talk to anyone, speak about for anyone else. As a candidate, I ran for office and I went to about 120 of Georgia's 159 counties. 
And there's not a story in one of those counties that's identical to a story in another one because everyone deals with their challenges differently. We have rural Georgia, coastal Georgia, North Georgia, middle Georgia, you name it. When we're looking at a situation like this, the problem that I have is that the message we're trying to convey is that if these corporations, and, and, and please, for anyone else that has an opinion, I'm all for differing opinions on this, but the message we want to convey is number one, stop financing our oppression when you're giving to these campaigns and you're playing both sides by saying, we're going to give all this money over here, but you're still funding an individual that's co-sponsoring a bill. That's a problem. And, and too often, and I'll end with this, too often we're seeing this challenge where we're starting an economic push and then we're allowing it to be co-opted by folks that are saying they're our allies when the reality is their, their, their support for us may be genuine in many cases. I think we've done a good job. And Ken Chenault, who disrupted American Express, led those hundred CEOs, and he's a brother. And I, and I believe those CEOs are feeling the pressure and they're attempting to do the right thing. The challenge with that is the long game has to be well beyond our rhetoric and we have to be consistent on what we stand for. And for me, when I say I'm absolutely for a boycott to Dee's point, it's because I fundamentally understand that in the 32 years I've been in the state of Georgia, I have seen time and time again where we start something and it's consistent and it's great, but then we have short-term memory as to what the next challenge or opportunity is. So I feel that in this space that we're in right now, we owe it to ourselves and for the generations that are watching to stand up against this, whether that's economically, socially, but well, our message has to be consistent. We have to be in the same room. It's not going to be perfect, but we'll at least have the result that we're all seeking. And to, to piggyback on the uh, on the words of our future Lieutenant Governor, Daniel Blackman, uh, I, I think we have to uh, just be plain about what we are saying. Uh, Neil Silo has, has a great line and one of the Goody Mob songs where he said, uh, the life of a Negro is still cheap. And what we see often is that when it comes to these uh, these social activism uh, situations, uh, the, the corporation show up for check and everybody gets quiet real quick. Uh, we'll all talk big talk about what everybody else needs to do. Uh, check starts clearing and then people start shutting up. And that's how we ended up with the 2011 electoral compromise that got us in this situation. This is how we ended up with the 2006, uh, uh, 2005, going into the 2006 poll tax um, that showed up. It's short-term gain, being able to buy off elected officials and political leadership, and that's how you end up in a situation where you can't actually actively reflect the will of the, uh, of the people of the state of Georgia. Um, to Teresa's point earlier, we have seen this exact same thing happen before in apartheid South Africa in the late 1980s going into the 1990s. I remember Gil Scott Heron, what's the word, Johannesburg, all that stuff, which is where you had an entrenched minority group which held all the money and power and they were able to continue to control politics and control the future of the nation because they controlled all the money. And so right now, until black folks are willing to stand up and really fight for our actual political representation, because there's no way in hell you're going to convince me that a state with 35 percent black people is going to have a constitutional majority for Republicans in the House and the Senate and every single statewide elected official without a uh, scout duggery going on. And then when you hear uh, folks who are supposed to be representative of the community saying, no, 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 let's not boycott. That'll hurt hurt somebody. Uh, well, we know what's going on. So we have to make sure we are holding those folks accountable and make these movements bottom up, not top down. Quit looking to see anybody else for solutions. It's easy to look uh, to say somebody else needs to do something as opposed to saying we need to do it ourselves. I think all the like minded organizations need to come together and start doing that. We heard a whole lot of stuff when Trump was president about what we need to do to stop racism. Trump is gone. The boogeyman is gone. People are getting quiet. We have to keep the noise going. Mm -hmm. Robert, I'm going to say something first of all. So I think that's why Kimberly, when she started off saying defund the GOP, we, I mean, that needs to be what we're saying consistently, uh, because I think you just piggyback on what she started with. We got to defund the GOP because the very ones they're funding is the ones who are uh, co-conspirators in our oppression. And we are, too. We have become co-conspirators in our own oppression. And I'm telling you, it's not looking good. So it's 920. We're not supposed to be on here past an hour. So... And we haven't even gotten to this poor little Dante Wright who got shot in Minnesota. So the first question, I'm going to ask all of y'all. People want to know what boycott them. What is the boycott? Who we boycotting? How we boycotting them? See, that's part of the issue that I think we're, that we're dealing with. Are we boycotting corporations? Are we boycotting sports and entertainment? 
And I'm appreciative of people like uh, Will Smith who say, you know what, we're not getting food with y'all, George. Y'all out y'all cotton picking mine. So come on, talk to me, y'all. What we doing? What, what are we? What, what are we boy? What is the boy kind? I think right now we're boycotting everything. Uh, <laughs> but specifically, we have a leader that's boycotting the sports and entertainment. And then we have another set of leadership that's boycotting the uh, corporations. Then there's the grassroots just want to boycott everybody, right? So, I mean, but I think the, I think the key thing for all of us in this community is let's stick together through the boycott, I think there's going to be a series of boycotts that's going to happen until we get what we want uh, with this democracy. And and I would say not not to monopolize because I can't talk literally all day and all night. I can turn off the camera. I'll keep going for probably an hour or two. Uh, uh, but let, let's understand: we live in an oligarchy. We do not live in a democracy, particularly in the state of Georgia. There's the will of the people is insignificant when it comes to politics in the state. So when we talk about boycotting, we're talking about those industries and those companies that are pouring money into the state. Uh, uh, Georgia no longer gets the majority of their money from uh, from cotton and peanuts and peaches. That's just that, that's the way our economy worked when Jimmy Carter was president. We got our money from the movie industry. More uh, uh, the number one place on the planet Earth in the last two years that movies have been filmed is Georgia. In no other location on the surface of this planet has more had had more movies filmed there than Georgia. More albums have been made in Georgia than anywhere else in this country. So when we talk about boycotting sports and entertainment, it's telling these people to put their money where their mouth is. Right now, I'm uh, in the background playing Madden uh, behind the camera, and on the back of all the helmets, it has in racism and how all these social justice messages from 2020. Uh, we have to make sure that we are enforcing that, telling these folks who said that they were with us last year, putting billboards on the highways and printing T-shirts and putting uh, uh, paint in the streets to say Black Lives Matter, that they stand with us right now when the rubber hits the road. And I think that we can get the movie, the sports, the entertainment industry to support us. Then this law will get changed by the end of the month because we saw it with a transgender bathroom bill in North Carolina. We saw it with the Super Bowl and in, uh, in Arizona over the Martin Luther King holiday. So it's doable. We just have to make sure we, we make people. People uh, have the rubber hit the road. Okay, Cameron or Leonard. I think you know the great point, but I want to get back to something where Ms. Carter uh, had mentioned about the defunding the GOP. One of the issues, and the reason why we're at New Order, looking at a more uh, moving into uh, more work on officials and elected officials, mm -hmm. is because we have to hold these people accountable. And we will expose you going forward. If you are not on our side, mm -hmm. the Democratic machine in Georgia, there's something wrong with it. And I have been told that when, the, when more monies come in and things like that, where do they go? They go to people whose mind they're trying to change as opposed to those people that they're trying to encourage. We need new voters in the system. We need a system that says every high public school must be pushing civic responsibility. Whether you have individuals from the state come in and do, what do they call those little things, the auditorium visits to talk to kids about the importance and their civic duties because they're ready. They thought that the elders were, were more responsible with this issue. But what young people in the grassroots organization has a problem with is we're not trying to control people's fire, but we are quick to point out what is and what is not working. We uh, no, use memorandum. Let me ask you a question. I, I don't want to cut you off, but you said we should call people out. Who are we calling out? Because a lot of times, and I'm, I'm putting you on the hot spot because you yeah. know you're the one who, who can handle the heat. Well, we all can, actually. But when I say who are we calling out, I don't mean necessarily that individual. I mean, when we speak up against our own people will say, well, you're a hater or why are you speaking out? But when we are talking about the very livelihood and liberation of our people, are we irresponsible for not calling them out or for uh, compromising when it's not time to compromise? So sometimes as black people, we compromise before it's even necessary. It almost reminds me of slavery when somebody even tell you that you needed to go out and feel, you just uh, sent yourself out there. That's I'm going to feel exactly, for you. Exactly. I, I don't understand, but go ahead, Leonard. Too Finish. many people are playing a role. So we have to bring them back to reality to allow them that this 
seat belongs to the people in memory of big brother Harun. It's not your seat. And if you're not operating in our best interest, let me find out how many bills have you sponsored in uh, regarding the interest of your constituents. When I go look at bills, I see the names that I see. Okay, who proposed this? Who proposed that? One of the biggest balls dropped has been, why don't black people have voter voting rights in the perpetuity? We, we talk about how much power we got, but you ain't got voting rights in the perpetuity. So why I'm gonna keep fighting for something that y'all talking about every so often. So these are the issues. Yeah, I know you've been around for 25 years, but Mr. 25 years, why are we still where we at today? You got to go. I love you. I love the color of your skin and all that beautiful melanin. But the truth of the matter is you've been sitting in this seat and all you did was sit here and, and your only bills deal with commemorations for namesakes. Ooh. You, you're out of there because you're not working. We need working politicians like Daniel Blackman, who will come in and explain to you exactly why he running, why it's important and what you need to do to help him make that happen. That's the message you have to give young people. What you can't do is, well, what about this? Well, it's complicated. No, you may be incompetent. And if, 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 if I can extend something that Leonard said, you know, we, we gotta stop thinking that they're not gonna be, there's not gonna be an impact, right? When, when I ran for office, I made a conscious decision that I would not take a check a dime from any corporation that was regulated by the Public Service Commission. As a matter of fact, we gave back $3,100 in donations from folks that just felt I was the right person for the job, but I gave them, I, I returned the money because we took a pledge that we would not take money from industries that are regulated, um, whether it was an environmental organization or a corporation, because like Shirley Chisholm said, she's unbought and unbossed. When you look at the American Legislative Exchange Council and the fact that ALEC, which 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 fundamentally crafted many of the bills that we're seeing today, um, and you look at the corporations, over 112 corporations, to my knowledge, that openly supported them. And I'm not talking about corporations that no one knows about. I'm talking about major corporations that funded this, that had been saying we're allies. They, this was 2016, 2017 before the same corporations that were given to Reverend Lowry's birthday, Andrew Young's birthday, John Lewis's birthday, were the same folks that were funding the Tea Party Patriots at the height of this movement. So we gotta stop acting like these organizations, these corporations that are saying they're gonna do the right thing on paper. They're making hundreds of billions of dollars. So a $2 million donation to one of our HBCUs, that's not enough. I mean, we, we, we gotta stop allowing people's paycheck to buy our silence and we're, we're too often we're in a position to your question you said who are we boycotting in my opinion i think it was laid out great and i think it was it, it, it was um attorney patillo that said it when you look at the amount of money that we see in in atlanta and the amount of money that comes into the metro to, into georgia excuse me and the fact that our culture is our vibranium pun intended and when you see all the culture from music, sports, and entertainment that has come into this state and to see, and, and I'm proud of the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus for pushing back against the gaming industry that said, we want to come in in this space. And we said, no, 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 hold up. If you guys are going to suppress our vote, there is nothing else to talk about. And we have to stop compromising time after time. And we've got to be responsible for educating people. I think Hank Stewart said it. He said the responsibility of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious of their unconscious behavior. In other words, folks that don't know have to understand and we have to educate them and we have to make sure they're informed and we have to hold the line. If we don't, then those folks that come after us are not going to understand the importance of it. And they're not understand. They're not going to understand their role in the fight that all of us are committed to. Well said. OK, y'all, it is 929, 930 and we don't want to hold the people too long. We got to get off of here. So our pardon statements, uh, this boycott, we the only thing that I've seen consistent so far, now this is just me because people may see something else. Y'all may see something that I have not seen. And that is as it relates to sports and entertainment. That message has been to me, to a certain degree, concise. Um, and we've seen the action. Major League Baseball pulled out. 
We've seen Will Smith pull out. Others are talking about it. Corporations have been talking about how, where do we go from here? Tomorrow, my bishop, Bishop Reginald Jackson, and some other faith leaders, some more people will be talking to corporations tomorrow, I guess, to see what they're going to do um, in regards to the demands that were given. But the, the end of the day, the question is, still, who and what are we boycotting? And how do we get that message out about who and who and what we're boycotting? And when do we start? Have we ever, have we already begun? I mean, those are questions every day people are asking. But, but and we I need to have some something? answers. But, but Go ahead, I, Kimberly. Can I say something? And, and, and I just I just want to, to, to be very clear on this. Um, when the corporate accountability um, began, when, when we began to mobilize around corporate accountability, the first move that was made was the full page ad that was taken out not only in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, but across the state in various um, Black-owned um, newspapers and media. And the corporate accountability part of where we began this movement was because in the past, all of those companies that generally, um, when there was a heartbeat bill, they were there, they were present, they applied the necessary pressure. When there was, when there were bills and legislation attacking the LGBTQ plus community, these same corporations were there, they were present, they stood with us and they applied pressure. And so in this particular um, situation with, fourth, uh, with the 531, 431, 202, all of these bills that were coming at us, we looked to our left and we looked to our right and we didn't see our corporate, um, we didn't see the corporate community that has stood with us in the past on legislation there. So that is why the corporate accountability campaigns began. And that is why our young people in New Georgia Project and Black Voters Matter and Georgia Stand Up and the People Uprising and even the NAACP started taking to the streets and showing up um, at Coca-Cola, at Georgia Power, wherever they could, saying, we have not heard from you. And then, unlike, I mean, we can't um, mimic what happened with the protest in South Africa because we're in a very different time. We've never had this many black CEOs or black folk in some of these positions. So this move that Ken Chenault and Robert Smith and Melody Hobson made, that is historic within itself to see them say to their colleagues, oh, you gonna stand up for our folk That's and right. against these things. That has never happened before. They are still working on the inside. The next corporate accountability mm -hmm. pressure that we are placing is on the head of Georgia power and the head of AFLAC. The president of AFLAC is a black woman who refused to sign on with these black CEOs. The current CEO of Georgia Power is Chris Womack, a black man who also refused to sign on with these black CEOs. So there is still pressure being applied and we have to allow that pressure in all of these different spaces to work. The only time that the word or term boycott came into play, and I'm a fifth generation AME, was when my bishop, Bishop Reginald Jackson, began to talk about this is not enough. They're taking too long. We need to put a boycott in place. And from that point, um, that is when others were like, it's time to come to the table. It's time to strengthen these lukewarm pablum um, statements that they had made before. So what I'm saying is that we are in a process and I know that it feels uncomfortable and I know that it feels disorganized and I know that it feels like it's not working, but it is. Thank you. It is working. It is. It's, it's absolutely working. 
And the part that I've seen work the most has been Major League Baseball when it pulled out of Georgia and people started paying attention. And I'm not saying corporations weren't listening. I'm saying that kind of money, $100 million at one time, boom, at least coming out of Georgia, that right there got everybody around the country eyes open because baseball is America's game. And when they said, we're taking the All-Star game up out of Georgia, everybody was like, okay, what's really going on? Let us put all our eyes on Georgia and his voting rights bill so that this won't come by us in our own individual respective states. That, that's just me. But I, I appreciate you and I'm glad you gave a history lesson well, the foundation, Kimberly, um, of how this came to be. Because last week, Teresa and I talked about it a little bit, how uh, New Georgia Project Black Votes Matter came to the table with corporate social responsibility, NAACP, and how we were grateful for that. But then it took Reverend, Lewis, uh, Reverend Jackson, who is the king of protests of those who are still alive and with us, it was very influential in that whole divestment from South Africa and how that, and I know you said it's not like that, but as things change and people progress into positions, yeah. then that movement can change. And even more impactful, if those who are at the table uh, divest, you know, you know, and defund the GOP. So I think it can be done to a certain degree, but we got to see what that looks like because we haven't talked about what that looks like yet. And now we can't talk about it because it's nine thirty six. But when do we come back, y'all? When do we when do we reconvene? Are we gonna play wait and see what happens tomorrow? What are we doing? Are we gonna continue to push for corporate social responsibility? I'm so grateful that Kenneth and Chanel and all of those even call for me because that at least shows that they're conscious. I I, I would say this because I know we're up against time. Um, first of all, I want to thank each of you that are on here, and yeah, I want to thank you for organizing it, and, and I thank you for a panel that's not just you know one perspective. I think Kimberlyn gave some amazing points. She's a sister I respect around this state, and I, I want to say this: I think that this conversation um, has to happen again, and, and, and we have to reconvene in some capacity because there are folks looking to us for information that aren't at the table. And there's something I said consistently throughout my campaign, which is if you're not on, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And too many folks in our community, um, they're not a part of New Georgia Project or Black Voters Matter. They're not a part of a civic organization, not because they don't want to, not because they've been unengaged, but they simply just don't have the capacity for it. So we have to make sure that we share this information. Two things I'd like to see is one, we reconvene, and two, folks like Kimberlyn, myself, Robert, um, Teresa, Leonard, all of us, we, we, we talk offline and continue to share information because I can guarantee there are folks that Kimberlyn is reaching that I'm not reaching and there are folks that I'm reaching that Kimberlyn's not reaching, not because we, you know we're, we're not working hard, it's just because we're all over the place and we have our circles and our networks. So I want to thank you all for allowing my voice to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, D. And, thank and, you. And just to, uh, to piggyback, because uh, I, I think this has been a great session. Uh, I think Secretary of State uh, Hagler has done an awesome job. I think that uh, Lieutenant Governor Blackman have done an awesome job in setting the table for what we need to do. Uh, what I am doing and what I think we need to do collectively is call on all civic minded organizations. Everyone who believes in this cause of, of the right to vote in this state to, uh, to put your money where your mouth is to move your conferences out of the state of Georgia, to move your conventions out of the state of Georgia. I don't care if it's the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus, we can all meet up in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Uh, I, don't, I don't care if it's the Divine Nine, we can go meet in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And uh, what we have to do is lead the way. And I think we do that as one united voice that we are going to be taking our money and divesting uh, out of the state. We, um, I've told uh, Rep our Secretary of State uh, Hagler this, um, previously, we're going to be moving the Rainbow Push Coalition Conference out of Atlanta. It has been here since the year 1999. This is going to be our 22nd annual conference. And we're not going to do it in the state of Georgia as long as these laws are on the books. I think if every organization does that, then we can have a real impact. The Rainbow Push Conference here in Atlanta generates an estimated $100,000 in revenue for the city every year uh, and for the state every year. If you uh, multiply that through a Rainbow Push, SCLC, uh, uh, ACLU, uh, uh, NAACP, and every other alphabet soup organization you can think of, then we can really make an impact on the state and make these corporations understand that you cannot simply pay us the racism fine. 
when I talk about the racism fine, I mean, well, when you shoot a black person, it costs you 10 to $20 million. And most cities are fine with paying that. When you pass a voter suppression law, it might cost you $100 million. Most cities and states are fine with paying that. We have to make the financial penalty for racism so high that they are no longer willing to bear that burden. And that's when you see public policy change. Now, I think the Secretary of State Hagler, Lieutenant Governor Blackman, and everyone else who is leading the charge on this. If we join together, we can make the real change that is needed. Robert, you get ready to start a ruckus, putting me and Daniel into this. Do you you do know that? Daniel, they starting a ruckus on this dog on podcast. We, we catching everything. To update my um tracking spread for the 2020, 2022 races. And and um and brother Jones, um, let's definitely connect. Um, after, Most definitely. Um, this call because um, you were speaking a few of my love languages and, and three of my love languages are candidate recruitment, candidate development and policy. And uh, those are all extremely critical um, uh, points that we need to talk about more when we talk about what do black futures look like um, in the political landscape. Thank you. And then Teresa Hardy. Yeah, I just want to uh, bring it back to what uh, Mr. Jones said, uh, who's my cousin, my mama's maiden name. <laughs> so I just want us to make sure that we do start to collaborate more on the civic en engagements. Um, not that you don't have the capacity. Let's make the capacity. Here's how you make the capacity with the NAACP. You join and it's $30, okay? If we get everybody in the state of Georgia to join the NAACP, that is powerful. That would make us be able to make a change as it relates to the national organization or wherever the conventions get done. We are fighting for the advocacy of policy changes as well. Of course, we're going to fight for voter suppression. We're fighting for education, criminal justice, health, and our youth. And that's going to be our biggest thing. So it's not just this one thing, like Kimberly said, there's not one issue that we need to be working on. There's several issues that we need to work on in our community, and it takes all of us. One little key thing that I want to leave with you guys, the power of unity is in you. And that means you in your home, you in your community, and you in your church. So I look forward to seeing all of you in the streets. Thank you. Leonard, do you have any closing remarks? It's a blessing to be here and to see you, Miss D. You just don't know how much you encourage me, um, you know, dealing with politics the way we deal with them here in Georgia. And I just want uh, grassroots organizations to understand grass is cut. It can easily be burned up if it gets too hot. You need to work on building and planting trees, That's trees right. that last as long as a John Lewis. Mm -hmm. You can't show up every now and then. You have to be serious about the continuity of leadership. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have our people in those seats making decisions for us. If the Democratic Party needs to change its names to the People Party to make mm -hmm. this happen, they need to do that. Mm -hmm. But in order to impress new voters, new people that are becoming adults, mm -hmm. you need to speak directly to them and you mm -hmm. need to have a grocery. You need to have a list of things that you're going to do. And that's what you need to come home from the store with. <laughs> I said that. You said that. You should have said the word tonight. You said grass. You can water grass, but it can also be burned down. Good God tonight. Okay. Whoa. Y'all know this is some powerful stuff tonight. Okay. So y'all, I, I hate to, to cut it off because I really want to be respectful. People have really stayed with us on all of our platforms. I'm going to all three. Um, but the last thing of the night, uh, Dante Wright, the woman said that the police officer said it was a mistake, y'all. And we could let's see if we can do this in five minutes. She said it was a mistake. What say you? So she 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 get a, you know a pass because it was a mistake. Yeah, I mean she said she didn't mean to pull the gun. She was trying to pull the laser. What uh, it D, so D, look, this this is the thing that I always try to tell people. Look, I got a gun next to me at all times, just in case. But ain't no way in hell I'm gonna accidentally <laughs> pull out a taser when I thought. Robert, it was a show gun. us what you got again. Show me that one more time, Robert. Oh, this is my uh, my AR forty seven shoots um two two or uh, seven point six two ammo. Yeah, I keep one with me at all times, just in case. But the whole point is, nobody accidentally shoots somebody when they thought they were tasing somebody. That's not realistic. And I think if any of us try to claim that at a trial or anywhere else, they'll put us up under the jail. 
So we have to hold them to those same requirements and to those same standards and make sure that we uh, demand justice in this case, just like every other. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Because Dante writes, child and mother will not be seeing him today. They go next time they see him, they're going to be viewing him and not seeing him in the person. I think the larger question is um, the systemic problem that we've faced over and over again. You said, was it a mistake? Um, John F. Kennedy said an error does not become a mistake until we refuse to correct it. And we have refused to correct the interactions with law enforcement and black folks for a long time. And I think it's time to change that. That's my comment. Woo. Anybody else? Kimberly, Teresa, Leonard. Be blessed. Okay. That um, I, I, uh, for, from my perspective, I think that we need to begin to engage in conversations where we reimagine what community safety looks like, um, where we reimagine um, what law enforcement truly is. Um, this brand of justice does not bend the arc towards justice. It only bends it towards more death, destruction, and injustice. And so, um, and so today I, you know, then looking at ways and looking at my mapping, trying to figure out um, how far the drive is to uh, Minnesota from Georgia. Uh, because it's beginning to to look like uh, we need to be up there um, helping with some organizing and some with some organizing and support of our people on on the ground there, but um, but definitely we need to reimagine policing and reimagine um, what uh, our what safe communities are. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. And you do. And if you lead the charge and get us in the car, honey, we will be in the car with I know, you. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine our girl trip. So, yeah, I'm trying right. to get us on the road to, to Minnesota and we can stop over and, and you know, and pay our respects to to Prince and, and all of that. We can stop at Paisley Park and Lake Minnetonka and keep mm. on moving up, um, up the road. I felt that one, honey. Oh, yes. Okay. Everybody's clear. All hearts and mind clear. Teresa, if you end up racing people, what you think? <laughs> hey, I, I, you know, that's not a mistake. I uh, believe that we do need to uh, seek justice. And uh, until uh, uh, no justice, no peace. That's what I'm going to end with. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Thank y'all. We, we're finished. We're going to reconvene. I don't know when. Y'all, we might have to reconvene one day this week based on what happens with the, you know, the bishop tomorrow and the corporations and and how this takes a turn and more corporations and entertainers and, I, and think, I, I, think, I think we need to reconvene um since this uh george floyd case um uh, is about to be handed over to um the defense i don't even have to be on i would just love to hear all of you talk about how you feel about this um how this prosecution has run i think it has been probably the most amazing um prosecutorial uh, uh, uh debut of evidence um that, that i've ever seen it has been absolutely um, amazing how they every uh, witness it, it, it has just been um, um, absolutely amazing. I would love to hear all of you um, talk. Absolutely amazing. And let me just say this every last one of you have been absolutely amazing. Daniel Blackman, they pushing you to run for lieutenant governor. I heard it on the call tonight. Uh, <laughs> Jones uh, standing in for um, Gerald Rose. We thank New World Order. Teresa Hardy, of course, you're always, you know, you're part of Black Girl Chit Chat and then you have NWATP. Uh, Kimberly Carter, you're part of Black Girl Chit Chat and Rep. George, we thank you. And Robert Patello, thank you for laying out that bill. You all catch Robert Patello every Sunday on WAOK 1380. And Robert, what time shows it? Two to five? Two, one. It's one to four. You were on, you were on yesterday. <laughs> I was I'm a frequent listener, and I've never gotten a coffee mug or T-shirt every Sunday. Look, look, and he, 
He speaks truth to power. And then thank all of you all who are coming and listening to me today. Like a lot of times people like, DJ, just go ahead and just do a podcast. People will, t- will tune in. Well, now we see that because I had this dynamic panel. We all together. Everybody's tuning in. Please share it so people can see what we talked about today. And we will reconvene sooner than later. So thank every last one of you all. We are out tonight. Thank everybody who listened. It's 950. All hearts and minds are clear. We're out. Y'all stay on. Everybody have a good night. Okay.